Good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Cameron Carey. I'm the Ann R. and Andrew H. Distinguished Visiting Fellow here at the Brookings Institution. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here uh, to Brookings. Uh, welcome those of you who are participating in the, the webcast uh, this morning. Uh, and and uh, as you see, we can uh, uh, tweet or otherwise uh, uh, communicate about this with the hashtag at, at privacy framework. Uh, uh, and this is certainly a timely discussion this morning. We are in the middle of a time of uh, ferment in privacy policy. Uh, most of you probably saw the headline in uh, Politico uh, the week before last, the invasion of the privacy principles, um, as many different organizations in town are uh, working uh, on privacy policy um, and you know, looking ahead to the prospect of legislation. Tomorrow the Senate Commerce Committee uh, begins what is apparently uh, the first of a series uh, of hearings. Uh, uh, other uh, committees, other members uh, uh, of Congress uh, uh, are you know, at work uh, uh, on bills in uh, one way or another. Uh, and, uh, and so that's uh, really the setting for our discussion uh, this morning. Uh, as a former Commerce Department official, uh, I am uh, uh, certainly pleased uh, that the Commerce Department, uh, NIST, uh, and NTIA is uh, playing a leadership role in uh, uh, the, uh, the executive branch uh, discussions uh, uh, of these issues, um, uh, and you know, I hope, uh, in some respects, building on uh, work uh, that we did in uh, the prior administration uh, when I was there, um, uh, but certainly uh, the times have changed both in terms of the issues and I think the intensity uh, of, uh, of focus. Um, uh, and I'm sure you pleased to have the NIST framework uh, as a focus uh, of this discussion today. I believe that NIST is one of the great uh, unsung stories of the federal government. Uh, every time I said I have to work on an issue, uh, NIST uh, had some piece of it. Uh, uh, it has, uh, you know, counts for Nobel uh, Prize winning scientists. Uh, uh, among uh, its staff, um, and is no stranger uh, to the issue of privacy. For um, uh, more than 15 years, NIST has uh, uh, put out the 853 series uh, uh, of documents that prescribes privacy uh, standards and practices uh, for federal agencies. Uh, uh, and when we set out uh, to rebuild the privacy program uh, uh, in the Commerce Department, our internal privacy program, turned uh, to NIST for an active, uh, acting uh, uh, chief privacy uh, officer. Um, uh, and, of course, the cybersecurity uh, framework uh, uh, includes uh, uh, privacy elements, uh, um, you know, where uh, Naomi Lefkowitz, who uh, will moderate our second panel, uh, was the, the key leader. So today's program is going to explore uh, the applicability of that sort of framework uh, approach uh, to privacy. We'll have discussions of those issues, uh, how we do that, uh, some of the practices uh, involved among the panels, we'll have opportunities uh, uh, for uh, questions. Um, I do uh, want to acknowledge uh, the support uh, of uh, uh, two of the organizations that are represented on our panel. Uh, um, uh, J.P. Morgan uh, uh, and uh, Intel Corporation. Uh, uh, we welcome their support. It is Brookings's uh, choice uh, uh, of speakers uh, uh, is independent uh, of that sponsorship. In fact, I, know, I didn't know that they were sponsors until I was told I had to do a disclosure statement because they were on, on the panel. Um, uh, so 
before we have the panel discussions, uh, we will hear both uh, about the developing framework uh, and uh, uh, framework uh, being uh, developed um, by, by ITIC. Um, so we will begin uh, uh, with uh, Walter Copan, the uh, NIST director um, and uh, undersecretary uh, uh, of commerce uh, um, as well. Um, he is uh, a scientist, uh, a chemist, um, uh, spent uh, a long uh, career in research and development and uh, tech transfer and commercialization issues, um, both at national labs, uh, the energy department, um, and in the private sector, um, and has served uh, uh, on government uh, advisory committees as well. So please welcome uh, Director and Undersecretary Walter Copan. Uh, and thank you all. I'm honored to be with you today to discuss what we all recognize as a pivotal issue for our time. For two decades now, the internet has been a job creating, economy growing con con uh, consumer convenience bonanza, and it has changed business, democratized information access, and transformed how we interact as human beings. The internet, mobility, Computing, global positioning, communications technologies have driven unprecedented innovation and economic value in the United States and around the world. Companies that are now major forces in these fields and with substantial market capitalizations to match did not even exist two decades ago. Internet applications have permeated every aspect of our lives and surveys in the last few years show that Americans collectively check their mobile phones eight million times a day, eight billion times a day, amazing. <laughs> Which brings me to today's dilemma. How do we maintain the clear societal benefits from the internet and from emerging technologies like the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing without jeopardizing our privacy and security? It's boiled down to two words. An appropriate answer might be, it's complica complicated. That's also the impression that most consumers have when they tr actually try to read the terms of use of their uh, privacy agreements, when they try to have uh, the decisions made uh, when companies ask them to do so. They click to accept the terms. What will it mean? What risks might they be encounter? And what are the unintended consequences? Indeed, finding ways to continue to improving with the internet while simultaneously protecting privacy is difficult and complicated, but it is just as clearly necessary. An approach to protect privacy is to develop and implement more regulation. The European Union implemented its General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, and, uh, and it came out in May of this year. The text includes 11 chapters, 99 articles, and more than 170 recitals, or whereas clauses that explain why a particular provision is needed. The new GDPR requirements were described by the New York Times as bringing sweeping changes to how companies operate online. We've also seen how some of our largest companies have struggled, and they deal with these struggles publicly. Uh, they, uh, the concerns about privacy and data use have dramatically affected stock prices and other financial performance measures, as well as reputations. And now California has taken up the issue and issued a new privacy law this summer. And across the nation and around the world, we see a developing patchwork of regulations. It's driven by good intentions and with a goal to properly consider ethics. It is also an unsustainable model. It's too soon to tell how large an impact these regulations will ultimately have on the products and services that rely on access to users' data and whether there will be substantial, measurable improvement in desired pra uh, privacy outcomes. At a minimum, the new EU regulations have spawned a rash of privacy policy messages to consumers' inboxes. And it's reminding consumers that free internet at, uh, software is typically paid for by access to personal data 
big data has big value. It also made companies worry that mistakes in implementing privacy protections could be very costly to them. Under the GDPR, companies can be fined up to 4% of their global revenues, which for some multinational corporations could amount to many millions of dollars. The Trump administration is committed to helping U.S. companies find practical uh, privacy solutions that support both innovation and strong privacy protections. My agency, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. NIST has announced a collaborative process to create a privacy framework, hence our meeting today. We envision this as an enterprise-level guide that companies and other organizations can use to manage privacy risks. In parallel with our effort, other two commerce agencies, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and the International Trade Administration are creating domestic policy approaches for protecting privacy that ensures consistency with international policy needs. For those of you who may not be so familiar with NIST, we trace our heritage to 1787. Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution. Later in that same article is the language that created the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, also part of the Department of Commerce. We were reconstituted in 1901 as the National Bureau of Standards, and to better reflect our broad scope, we were renamed the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 1988. NIST has a reputation for integrity, for the highest level of science and technology excellence, for being unbiased, transparent, collaborative, and honest. NIST is a non-regulatory institute. We're often called Industries National Lab. We specialize in measurement science and research in partnership with the private sector, and we support all of U.S. industry, from leg legacy technologies to emerging high-tech industries, computers, aerospace, 3D printing, telecom, medical diagnostics, advanced materials, cybersecurity, chemicals, bioscience, quantum-based technologies. NIST is right in there. Name any market sector that's emerged over the last century, and it's likely that NIST was part of its development and certainly helped improve its products and services through better measurement science, through standards, engineering, and accurate performance data. NIST is also the National Metrology Institute of the United States, and we support development of measures and standards internationally on behalf of the nation as well as for fair trade. We work with each state and territory of the Union to ensure that we have a trusted systems of measures so that no matter where you go to pump fuel, that you can be sure that the right amount is dispensed. You can rely upon the accuracy of your electric meter connected to the grid. And so you can understand that there's an accurate measurement system for the ride hailing apps that you use, perhaps even to get here today, so that you'll be charged fairly for your trip. So we are the federal agency tapped also in the president's management agenda to improve the process of moving technology from laboratory to market, from uh, federally funded R&D to commercial application. And so in fact, NIST is the only science and technical federal laboratory that is explicitly charged with fostering innovation to help industry create jobs and to grow the economy. So we're always looking for ways to help American companies improve their products and services, to enhance competitiveness, and to create useful standards together. I mention this as background because it may not be obvious why NIST has taken up this challenge, this privacy framework initiative. Through the lens of the S&T community, and as Cam mentioned before, we are a respected Nobel Prize winning world-class research organization that regularly announces groundbreaking research results as well as discoveries for advanced manufacturing. But over the last decades, NIST has been increasingly called upon to use its deep technical expertise and strong relationships with industry to find common ground and to help disentangle seemingly intractable issues. For example, on, on August 14, 2003, a cascade of electrical grid failures caused some 55 million people to lose power in eight northeastern states and in southeast Canada Investigations found that both human error and equipment failures had caused the event. Today, both new standards and new regulations adopted since then have lowered the risk dramatically that a similar blackout could happen again. NIST's role in this achievement beginning in 2007 was to assemble all 
of the relevant stakeholders from equipment makers to state regulators and to create a framework to achieve improved interoperability of the electric power grid, the so-called smart grid devices and systems. Now, 10 years later, more than 70 industry standards have been put in place with NIST leadership and with NIST support that now substantially lower the risk of blackouts. At the same time, these consensus standards make it possible for renewable energy sources such as wind and solar to be effectively integrated into the grid. And yet, even with something as seemingly straightforward as electricity distribution, privacy was a big issue. Some stakeholder groups and communities objected to the use of smart meters. They were concerned that patterns of electricity use could reveal private behaviors inside homes and other buildings. Of course, an even more direct relevant example to our topic today is NIST's work on the cybersecurity framework. There's that word again. Uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework was first issued in draft form in 2013. The project came about because of recognized concerns with the vulnerability of the nation's critical infrastructure, things like the electric grid, water companies, telecommunications, etc. And at that time, there was a disconnect between the acknowledged need for stronger, more comprehensive cybersecurity protections and the actual implementation of such efforts. Just as at this time, for this discussion, there's currently a disconnect between the acknowledged need for better agreement and a shared vision for strong privacy protections and agreed methods for achieving such a vision. In 2013, the headlines focused on cybersecurity breaches, where consumers' credit card information, social security numbers, and other sensitive, personally identifiable data had been hacked, even from large corporations or federal agencies. The threat of identity theft had long been recognized by the public but the frequency of these breaches reached a critical point in 2015. Then a regular survey by the Census Bureau and by the NTIA found that 63% of online households were specifically concerned about identity theft. And perhaps even more important in 2015 was the chilling economic effect from worries about ID theft. 45% of online households responding to the survey said concerns about cybersecurity risks stopped them from conducting financial transactions, buying goods and services, posting to social media, or expressing their opinions online. Now, NIST has had success in creating, uh, disseminating, updating, and evaluating the cybersecurity framework for use by organizations of all kinds, and it has made a positive impact for our security it has also been adopted as a standard by other countries. Our current project to create a new privacy framework is based on our experience, proven process, and success with the cybersecurity framework and the other frameworks that came before it. In case you're not familiar with the cybersecurity framework, just a brief description of version 1.1, the current uh, one is, it is voluntary. It's created collaboratively with expert input from across private and public sectors. It can be used by any size or any type of organization to help manage cybersecurity risks. It's written in English, and by that I mean it's understandable from everybody, from CEOs and entrepreneurs to the geekiest cybersecurity expert. Uh, it breaks cybersecurity risk management into five buckets for easier decision making and prioritization. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. It's a guide and not a one-size-fits-all prescription. It gives options to companies to consider and is backed up with best practices and documented solutions to implement depending on the specific threats faced by your organization carrying out your mission with your resources. It focuses on desired outcomes. It provides a common language and definition so that suppliers can better align cybersecurity choices to customers' needs so that people within an organization can hold one another accountable, and that organizations can better communicate to any stakeholder, including international customers and governments, how they manage risks. And finally, it turns out today's best practices, and it, sh it uh, transforms them into common practices through periodic updates. And it is not a magic bullet, uh, but it's driven by what our scientists call a feedback loop. 
It was originally created by soliciting feedback from thousands of stakeholders from industry, academia, government, from the US, and internationally. And that document is now revised to meet the new realities in the marketplace and to incorporate new cybersecurity approaches. Many organizations from government to multinational corporations to small businesses have successfully improved their cybersecurity posture by using that framework. By 2015, a Gartner study found the NIST cybersecurity framework was being used by more than 30% of US organizations surveyed and was expected to reach more than 50% by 2020. Which brings that, us back to this morning's topic, a privacy framework. If we have a strong cybersecurity framework, do we even need a privacy one? Yes, we do. Strong cybersecurity is a prerequisite for managing privacy risks, but it is not sufficient. Privacy risks also arise from how organizations collect, store, use, and share information, as well as from how people interact with the products and services. We need a different set of considerations to manage cybersecurity and privacy risks appropriately. So if you accept that a separate privacy framework is needed, then which elements of the cybersecurity framework plan should we consider in developing the new framework? All of them. We believe the new privacy framework should be voluntary, adaptable for use by any organization as an enterprise-wide tool. It should be understandable and implementable from the C-suite to IT experts to privacy advocates. It should provide a common language and inform privacy risk management decisions. It should be focused on outcomes tailored to an individual organization's needs. And it should also help organizations meet privacy obligations here and abroad. The intent of this new framework is to increase the effectiveness of privacy protections by enabling conscious, well-considered choices that are made by organizations based on their customer needs that are clearly communicated and understood. The new framework is further intended to enable innovation through technology solutions with privacy protections engineered in. The ultimate purpose of this effort is improved trust between businesses and their customers, between organizations and the public. Right now, there are many different perspectives on what strong privacy protection look like or what that even means. It's difficult to communicate quickly within and between organizations clearly about privacy risks. The conversation is complex, conducted in legally sometimes more often than in English, it seems, and is confusing even to experts. So what's missing is a shared lexicon and a practical structure that builds, that brings all parties together and is flexible enough to address diverse policy and privacy needs. For the rest of this morning session, we'll be hearing about the details and the challenges ahead in achieving what's a deceptively simple goal, better privacy based on addressing actual risks in a way that supports continued innovation. As the cliche goes, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. And we at NIST thrive on challenges, and we hope that you all do too, because we will need everyone's help to be successful in addressing this challenge. Today's discussion is just a beginning We'll be quickly following this up with another public workshop to gather more feedback in Austin, Texas on October 16th. There will be many more opportunities to share your good ideas, recommendations, as well as concerns in this journey. And over the coming year, we will offer multiple opportunities for input and to contribute to drafts of the privacy framework to help improve it. The bottom line is that we want the US to lead the way to a privacy future that maximizes privacy protections, innovation, and trust. We are looking forward to working with all of you to get there. Thank you so much. So, Director Coban, thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for that introduction to the framework. Uh, now, <clears throat> want to turn uh, to Dean Garfield of the Information Technology Industry Council, which I, I mentioned earlier. Um, I, you know, Brookings, I think, uh, just celebrated a year or two its its hundredth anniversary. Uh, and, I had not known until preparing uh, for this event that, that 
uh, ITIC has been around in some form uh, for uh, at least as long as that. Uh, uh, beginning as the National Association of Office Appliance Manufacturers. Uh, something that gives it a little bit of a Commerce Department connection because uh, uh, IBM uh, was founded by a former Census uh, Department uh, employee, Herman, Herman Hollerith, uh, who designed a machine to replace what uh, the humans, uh, who were called calculators, uh, who spent years uh, um, crunching the data from, from the census. Um, so I've certainly been aware of uh, ITIC's presence uh, in technology policy, but not uh, of, of that history. Um, and Dean Garfield has been a leader in uh, technology issues and IP issues uh, for many years. Uh, first, uh, at the uh, recording uh, uh, industry uh, Association and the Motion uh, Picture Association and president of uh, ITIC uh, since uh, 2009 um, and really has given that uh, organization today global reach. So Dean, uh, welcome uh, back to Brookings. Uh, look forward to, to your comments. Hopefully I've held up well for being 100 years old. <laughs> Let me begin by thanking Cam and the team at Brookings for putting together this dynamic event, thanking Dr. Copin and the team at NIST for all of the great work that they're doing. I'm tempted to simply associate myself with Dr. Copin's remarks and sit down, <laughs> but uh, I think there would be some folks, at least on my team, who would be disappointed if I did that. So. Let me endeavor to do two things. One is to speak to the imperative to act first, and then second, what I think we should do. In, in many respects, the imperative to act is driven by us. The manifestations of our imagination that are the transformative technologies that are carrying the day. As we think about context for this conversation, it's important to have it be grounded in, in what's going on. And it is my firm view that what's going on is truly awesome. We are, in fact, I think it will be as significant as hominoids going upright and walking out of Africa 200,000 years ago, or Homo sapiens becoming the dominant species on Earth 13,000 years ago. The integration of the cyber and the physical, the convergence of physical, cognitive, bio sciences is leading to innovations like CRISPR, where human beings have the ability to code and to change DNA and genome in the same way that we code software. It's leading to artificial or natural intelligence that will lead us to cure diseases that we previously thought were incurable or to just lead to safer streets. I noticed that DOT will be speaking on one of the panels later. It is leading to quantum computing where we'll be able to take on the most complex computational challenges that may ultimately sustain our planet. We are truly living in awesome times. It is that integration that is the context for this conversation and that leads Dr. Copan to say it is really complex. The connective tissue among all of those things are human beings and data. And protecting the individual rights as well as the broader societal issues that are at play. As human beings, it is our instinct to draw parallels to what we know as we deal with really complex challenges. And so in the context of data, our instinct is to revert back to what we know and set rules based on that. Whether it's land or the modes of production, how often have you heard the comparison of data to oil? 
And while it isn't true that data will likely be the engine of economic growth for our generation, it is not oil. It is a renewable resource. It is both here, everywhere, and nowhere. My ownership or access to data doesn't dispossess you of that data as well. Nonetheless, governments, as Dr. Copen noted, around the world are racing to cabinet, to control it, to own it, and to set up rules that align with what we know. From Brasilia to Beijing to Bombay, from South Africa to South Korea, even in the small island that I came from, Jamaica, they're moving ahead with rules around data trust and privacy. Thomas Jefferson spoke to the imperative well when over 200 years ago he noted that our constitution and laws should not change with the wind, but our laws and institution must go hand in hand with the transformation of the human mind. And so as we discover new truths, it is important that our laws and institutions change to reflect those new truths. And we are in a period of new truths. And so our laws and institutions must change to reflect that as well. And so what should we do? We should do what Dr. Copin said. <laughs> uh, from our perspective, in, in Cam noted the oversaturation of principles. Our organization is not working on a set of principles. We are working hard to develop a framework that avoids fragmentation and advances interoperability. And that helps the US government and hopefully the world to work through these complex issues. And that is ultimately what we think is needed here, which is an interoperable framework law in the United States that builds on what existed before, but adds based on context. And fortunately, there is much to build on. As Dr. Copin noted, and I'm sure we'll discuss in the panel, there's GDPR, but there is also CBPR and laws in a number of other nations. There is constructive criticism or critique that can be offered to GDPR, but there are as much that GDPR also got right. It's really difficult to be first. And so they deserve a lot of credit for being first and giving us data that can in fact inform what we do. GDPR is founded on an initial principle, which is the idea of protecting individuals and individual rights. That is something that we should incorporate in what we do in the United States and figure out how we give meaning and manifest that through advancing controls that enable consumers to make choice, that enable consumers to have access to be able to delete, correct, or port data. GDPR is also founded on principles that we should all support. The idea that the usage of data should be purposeful, fair, and transparent are one that I think are included in all of the principles that have been released uh, and should be integrated in whatever law is advanced here in the United States. GDPR recognizes that choice is not the sine non, not the seminal construct or consideration in thinking through the relationship between an individual and another, between a business on another, or an individual and a business. And that context is critically important. Those are considerations that should also be integrated in whatever we develop here in the United States. CBPR advances the art as well in recognizing the international nature of data today and the importance of data portability. Whatever we do here in the United States should incorporate that thinking as well. But as Dr. Copen noted, there is 
important work that's being done here that, that we can build on and extend as well, that may be uniquely American, but are principles that would benefit the world given the context in which we're currently operating. The idea of being explicit in considering all of the equities involved in the ecosystem is something that GDPR does not do that we would encourage in any legislation that's advanced here in the United States. The idea of leveraging technology to actually advance the consideration of privacy and the consideration of advancing trust is something that is not fully integrated in GDPR and that should be. Particularly as we consider the definitions of personal data the ability of technology to anonymize or pseudonymize and otherwise protect should be a part of the consideration as we think about the foundational definitions. The societal benefits from all of the innovations I mentioned at the beginning and the importance of research is something that is not fully as fully integrated in GDPR as it should be. And so in the United States, the is, there is the opportunity to do that. The idea that privacy risk assessment should be a continual process and not a check the box exercise focused solely on certain categories of data is a consideration that for some reason was left out of GDPR and so we think is worthy of consideration here in the United States as well. And finally, the idea that science and standards should be a foundation of the consideration around data, privacy, and building trust is our view, in our view, should be a part of the consideration here. And it's, it's exciting to see that that is something that is moving ahead even in, in advance of legislation advancing in the United States. Any of you that have paid attention to the guidance process in Europe as a result of GDPR and the quantum nature uh, of, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> should I, maybe I should have used the word interesting as a way of uh, conveying the thought. <laughs> has not been grounded in standards or science. Uh, Dr. Copen noted the cybersecurity framework in the United States and the processes and implementation there that in fact was grounded in standards and science and did something that was critically important and hopefully will be a model for the approach that we take here as well. The idea that whatever we do should pull together both the public and private sector should be advanced in a fashion that is adaptable so that we are not choosing winners and losers through legislation or regulation. The idea that rather than, which I thought was a stroke of genius, rather than focusing exclusively on US standards but looking globally to identify best practices from around the world that would have broad applicability in mitigating risk has helped the cybersecurity framework to be particularly impactful around the world as Dr. Copan noted. And so the imperative to act is I think clear and hopefully a little bit clearer as a result of our conversation and certainly hopefully by the end of the day what we should do, I suspect, even after this conversation will be, will continue to be cloudy, but over time, I hope we'll, we'll achieve clarity. We were noting in the conversation before coming in here that we've been talking about data security, privacy, trust for a long time. And it, it seems the time has finally arrived through the good work of NIST and NTIA. Uh, Travis is smiling. We're all counting on you, brother. <laughs> uh, to, 
to move the ball forward in a significant way. The thing that is encouraging to us and to me and the nearly 70 companies that are members of ITI is the growing recognition that these are not technical or technological issues. These are all of society issues. The only way that we will get it right, so to speak, is by all of us as human beings recognizing the context, engaging, and marching forward together. And so I very much look forward to working with and collaborating with all of you as we develop a framework in the United States that's workable globally uh, and that helps us to achieve what we all aspire to for humanity. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.